Greetings from Hong Kong, everyone. Welcome back and thank you for joining us. We have a favorite scene or a song that really moves us. We all have that. And a lot of us use these favorites for demonstrations. So we thought it would be an interesting topic to discuss how movie and music mixing engineers work to put that little magic in what we hear and what it is that they try to achieve when mixing movie and music content. So time for some introductions. We have our usual expert, John Calder, joining us again today. He is currently the director of retail at Acoustic Geometry, based in Minnesota, and he has four decades of experience as a musician, a recording engineer, audio post-production mixer, recording producer, and so on. And he has, in fact, earned gold and platinum records. We also have a new special guest, Gary Bourgeois. Gary is a noted re-recording mixer who has worked on films like Captain America, The Avengers, Hot Top Machine, and he has also worked on many successful TV shows like SWAT, Bull, and Timeless, and he won an Academy Award for sound. Is that right, Gary? Uh, close, no, and, 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 <laughs> but, I, but in that world, uh, I worked on numerous pictures that did win Academy Awards, so yeah, it's a team yes, effort, yes, you know? Yes, exactly. <laughs> All right, we also have Jeff Clark, Director from Software Engineering at Odyssey. He's based in LA, California. We have Glenn Stone, VP of Systems Architecture at DT IMAX, that's Xperi. So good morning, gentlemen, and thank you very much again. We really appreciate you making time for us. I'm now gonna hand it over to our host, Phil, and he joins us from his office in Carlsbad. Over to you, Phil. Hello, everyone. I am incredibly excited to, to do these sessions. We had a great one, alas, on, on, thir on Wednesday night, and it's nice to kind of peek beh behind the wall and talk to people who actually create content because we always talk about um, the goal is to recreate the rec creator's intent. What is the creator's intent? So we decided to bring in some creators. So I got to give Jim a shout out for this. This was his brainchild, and and it was it's it's been it's been really really good. And and talking to Gary and John, it has been amazing. And and this whole thing started because we were, we would, we had John come, and I noticed that and we noticed that he had a record behind him, and he started talking about um, not only doing. Um, his level of understanding of sound. How does it permeate in a room as well as how do you make good sound? So, so, it's, so we decided this would be a great, great opportunity. And then, you know, I, I found out that he has been involved in all of these cool projects from Neil Diamond to Rufus and Shaka Khan. He's, uh, and so he's, so he's a wealth of stories about what are engineers looking for when it comes to making to making a great song. Then um, we bring in Gary. And Gary, if you look him up and I, I 300 movies, 300 movies and TV shows, Gary, is that correct? So so because of that, yeah. he 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 kind of knows what, what he's looking for. So you should know what, what he's trying to trying to relate. He even did Pretty in Pink, well, by the way, which is like one of my favorite movies. I'm sorry, I love those. I love those types of movies. I am all in. So neither blow things up or cool old-fashioned teen comedies, right? I'm all about. I'm all about those types of comedies. And you are hurting my feelings calling Pretty in Pink old-fashioned. <laughs> it, is. it is. It is. It is. But I love it. I love it. I love it. So today, um, we want to just talk about, you know, the creative process and. Um, and maybe give you some tips on what you can do at home to get the most from that um, that content. What speakers should you buy? What should you kind of focus on? You know, why does things? Why do things sound like they do? And so and um so there was a couple of things that that we want to talk about. So let's talk first about music. And uh, and what kind of what kind of made me interested uh, and had me think about this topic was when um, we asked him for some photos and John went way back in the way back machine to actually show um, himself um, in in one of these rooms and I was looking at a lot of these recording studios like like this one and and some of the other recording studios if you look at all these recording rooms they all look different and I was asking how do you get the same sound in a when you're doing a stereo recording when all these rooms have different speakers and different boards and different rooms you guys want to talk about that yeah it's it's one of those anomalies in and i think uh, gary will address the film mix side but for music 
each of these rooms is so iconoclastic for its own, I guess, uh, followers. You know, different types of music go to different studios in Los Angeles and New York and London and wherever they are. Um, for a while, they looked a lot the same. The lower left photo is, I thought it was Capricorn, but it's actually Fantasy Studios. And these are designed, these were designed in the 70s um, by Tom Hidley and uh, Westlake Audio and, and a number of companies that Hidley um, inspired. And they were compression ceiling, um, big soffit monitors with what we used to call the wooden lips um, horns on the top end and big boards and, and 24 track machines. And um, this looks a lot like Kendon, which is where I worked in Los Angeles. And in the middle of the photo is where I started out in 1970 um, in Minneapolis. And um, these rooms are all different And the art of the music recording and mixing engineer is pretty much learn the room, then learn where instruments can go and where drums and pianos and everything else should go and be mic'd properly and then how does a control room sound and once you get used to that um, and the only way you get used to that is to mix a bunch of stuff record a bunch of stuff mix it take it somewhere else and play it in dozens of places and hear it on dozens of bad to horrible to great systems <laughs> then your your brain starts saying okay well i know what i need to do in this room to make it sound good in kind of an average system, but it's it's a challenge. And um, in the 70s, the rise of the independent engineer, these guys would bring their own monitors and a lot of their own effects and mics and everything else. And if you have the same speakers over and over again um, as near field monitors, you can get around some of the issues with the rooms, but it's problematic and that's part of the art is learning learning the room. How but, often do you change out the technology in these rooms back then or even now? Like, um, did they would this room be static for five years or or you know how how often did they change out all the mixer boards and stuff? You no, know, it's um, it's funny because both in New York and LA, the big studios, huge analog consoles like this, and this is a Neve. I, I can't remember which which version of a Neve console this is, but this is all analog equipment. Mm -hmm. um, in the 80s, we started, late 80s, we started seeing digital consoles. We'd already had digital recording. Um, and so we started seeing high level professional equipment go digital. And it was dicey for a while because nobody trusted it. Digital, you'd have to turn the machine off and on a million times. You know, it's like rebooting a computer. If, you're, if your digital recorder just stops working, on the best take that whomever is doing, you're, you're kind of um, kind of screwed. So it took a while to switch over, but the rooms themselves didn't change much from their original design. All of the consoles and recording equipment uh, changed, but the really lucky studios kept a lot of their old gear and uh, eventually sold it to artists for their own studios for millions of dollars. So <laughs> yeah, sticks around. Those old, that old console is worth a fortune. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, we while we talk about movies a lot with Gary, Gary actually started off uh, mixing records. So why don't you give him a little bit about your history when it comes to because you started off doing like uh, Janis Joplin or something. Who did you start off with? How did you get into how did you get into this, Gary? Actually, Janis, Janis was uh, was the 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 first uh, you know rock and roll artist that I worked with. Um, I I had just started at a studio. And uh, the generation of the engineers there were sort of like mm -hmm. the Frank Sinatra generation. And mm -hmm. when uh, you know Janice's uh, tapes came in and they listened to that, they just looked at me and said, "You know that stuff. We don't. Mm -hmm. You can have it. It's yours." I was I got lucky, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know the, uh, the the various studios that I worked in way back then, as John said. To a great degree, the, the technology and acoustics uh, to, for a lot of the studios were just outstanding, <clears throat> really outstanding. And when you mentioned, Glenn, about the, um, the technology change, quite often uh, rooms are left to life. They're good sounding rooms. That goes for scoring stages especially. Nice big scoring stages. They don't change the acoustics for beans. That doesn't change. But what does change are the uh, quite often the consoles or the recorders, you know, the, the, that sort of thing. 
And generally speaking, I found over the years that somewhere around eight years was like when there would be there would be big changes. Big uh, mixing console for our films were uh, up in the one million to one and a half million dollars per console. So you're not going to be tearing that thing out and changing it overly quickly. But over the years, we've gotten into digital, and <clears throat> we are now at a point where we're using mostly. Um, the S6 console, which is mm -hmm. very, very popular. Um, mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's basically just a audio workstation that's mm -hmm. manipulating the, uh, the and we mostly work in, uh, I would say 90%, 95% is in Pro Tools. Well, one thing that I noticed too was I had a chance to go to Battery Park uh, in New York and they actually, it's like they were they, there were certain things they swapped out and there's certain things that they kept. So, for example, the, the speakers that were in there, they kept those because everybody, that room with that speakers kind of had a sound that everybody was familiar with. And then there was a few things they changed. Like they had one room they, that, that, uh, that was like the last room that John Lennon recorded in and he left the studio and went home and that's where he got assessed. That's where he got shot. And they kept that room as close as possible to where it was when he the day he passed away. So it still has the posters, the couch, the um, even um, um, most of the electronics that are in there, or, or most of the analog stuff that's in there. And then there's a little bit of digital. They added just enough digital to do digital work in it. And it was really cool to step, step back into this room and have them play stuff, you know, from the 70s in a room that was designed in the 70s on a board that was from the 70s, from a tape player that was from the 70s. It was really kind of a, kind of a really, really cool experience. The other thing that I noticed that was cool was they had the master tape and I asked them, what happens if you damage your master tape? What do you, what would you use um, to back it up? And they said they had a, they had a big player there that would read that basically is, it's a record player. And they had, and it was basically, if they ever lost the tape, they had an early, 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 early high quality pressing of a record and that was going to be what they were going to try to get the if they if the tape ever kind of rotted because you got to bake them and all that kind of stuff they were that's how they were going to try to get the the um the analog track back was from a record that was kind of very interesting to me there are a lot of high, high profile historical uh studios that uh rarely ever change anything because they are literally known for their sound mm -hmm. and if anything changed artists literally wouldn't come for a long time, were analog only. They used 24-track um, tape machines, and um, and you know that's the, now that's ancient technology. And mm -hmm. the interesting thing is, you can take a 24-track tape from 1970, or well, mm -hmm. 1975, and mm -hmm. play it today. Um, you can't really do that with the, the digital equivalents from back then. So you know the file formats are more changeable than the analog. But you yeah. get a lot of guys that are dedicated to analog consoles and everything else. And of course, you need analog microphones so far. Mm -hmm. Andrew Sheps, who has done multiple, multiple platinum albums, who just refused to work in digital for years. Mm -hmm. um, and he's now to the point where he's completely mixing platinum albums in his laptop with a pair of headphones. Mm -hmm. He, did, he yeah. did that on an airplane flight once. And he said, well, you know, the plugins are good enough now and and everything sounds pretty good i'm i'm in the box as they say rather than yeah. out of the box running through consoles and everything else and so the sea change was digital obviously it's taken a long time in some cases a lot of studios are hybrids they're a mix of both but these days you know you can do an album on a laptop and it well, sounds pretty damn good well, well, let's talk about that because that's a that's an important that's a that's a big point. When you said you know the um, digital changed things, but it was it was higher resolution digital. We we're finally getting to the point where there's it, it's getting it's getting better and better and better, and people are starting to trust it more and more and more. It's just like if you look at film. Um, if I shot something in 70 millimeter film, Lawrence of Arabia. I can do a 4K, I can do an 8K, I can do whatever I want with that because the, the film had so much information on it. If you look at analog, all of this stuff we're doing, DSD, 192 FLAC, 124, is trying to make it sound like analog. So a lot of times um, people were hesitant 
be, um, to, to switch to digital at the beginning because it just didn't, couldn't hold enough of the information that would have been found in an analog piece of material, a record, um, a tape, or even film. But now we're getting to the point, like for example, George Lucas, he shot the early Star Wars stuff in film. They could do 4K, they could do 4K with that. But then he shot his earlier episodes, like was it episode one in HD? You're stuck in HD because he because the digital file was not high enough. And he can do better with the movie from the 70s than he could with the movie from the early 2000s because one was shot in analog and one in film and one was shot in um in uh in digital. And that's kind of maybe that's what's going on with digital now. It's, people are starting to trust it more because you have more resolution than what you used to have. Would you think that's probably what's going on, John and, and Gary? To a great extent, uh the any technology grows and uh at, at the i was involved with 3m uh at the very beginning of digital and we recorded um a big orchestra and it was in 8-bit <laughs> and when the, orchestra, <laughs> when the orchestra came down to just the flute player uh playing a solo you could hear all the quantization and this this sort of like breathing all around it um things progressed pretty darn quickly because it was relatively unacceptable. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the, there are advantages, there's pros and cons of using any system. And to tell you the truth, the people that are still enamored or in love with analog and that mm -hmm. sound, um, that, that sound is born out of its flaws mm -hmm. to a great extent. We, mm -hmm. we came to learn it, love it, mm -hmm. we wrap our arms around it. Mm -hmm. But if you're working in the in completely in the digital world, there are definitely ways that you can easily get that characteristic or that sound, that warmth, whatever. Um, digital actually gives you more access to, to a greater range of variables than ever before. Oh yeah, yeah. It's just like film. People love the grain of film, you know. But uh, if I shoot it digitally. Yeah. I have I, I shoot it raw. I have all my exposure. So if so if it's underexposed, I can over I can bring that exposure back. I can bring back highlight details, and I can add film grain at the end. So people, a lot of things, 24p and film grain was just it. It isn't a superior way of doing it. It's just people are kind of used to that look, kind of thing. Well, yeah. when, you know, one of the issues when people talk about analog. They, they've never aligned a 24 track machine record and play, which which I was at one point at Ken and I could do an entire MM1100, which is an ancient machine, um, play back and record. I could align that in 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. But if you didn't have tones from the original machine that the session was originally done on, you were stuck. You couldn't really align that. In digital, it's really if you've got a matching playback format is really all you're looking for. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of people that have done studies on high resolution and whether you can tell the difference between 44-1, 16-bit, 96K, or 192K, 24-bit. Um, and regardless of how those turn out, because it almost always turns out that 44-1, 16-bit, if done properly, is pretty dang good. Um, you won't find many people working today, certainly in the music business. Um, that want to work in 44.1 originally. They want to work in 96.24 because mm -hmm. it's far less fatiguing. And so when you talk to engineers, 96K, 24-bit is kind of how you work. That's how you store things. It's how you manipulate things. If you kick them out for a CD or for streaming or for whatever, you'll you'll go through the gear shifter to, to change the format. But most guys I know would much rather work in, in high res just because of the fatigue, daily fatigue factor. Yeah. When you say One daily thing, factor, do you mean like um, the, like having to work within the constraints of the of the sampling rate and, and bit depth, especially the dynamic range of, of a lower bit depth? No, would no seem it has like nothing to do with that. Most people just get get fatigued listening to twenty to, to forty four one sixteen bit all day long. It's just a <laughs> one of those sort of lesser known things. And I've talked to a lot of recording engineers who say, yeah, it's it's tiring. It, <laughs> you just doesn't sound work that, it just sounds digital. It's almost is that is that what's going on there? I'm not um, really sure. And and one of the things that you the, there's two problems with scientific um, A B testing. And when you do A B testing between speakers or or multiple formats or whatever, you're asking people to think about which sound they like better. 
Uh, the part of your brain that, that works in sound is the so-called lizard brain. It's way before your prefrontal cortex, and it doesn't involve thinking at all. And so a friend of mine said, we really ought to just hook people up with a lie detector type rig and, mm -hmm. and just check their, their physical response to sound, um, mm -hmm. respiration and skill, mm -hmm. skin galvanometer and that kind of a thing. Because mm -hmm. your body will tell you if you, if you like or dislike something. <laughs> it hasn't That's gone true. much farther than discussions over a beer or two. Just for what it's worth, uh, having gone through so many A-B tests for so many different technological changes over the years, even if you're doing it for a couple of hours uh, back and forth, is only a short burst of time. But if you're mixing for 12 hours a day, six, seven days a week, it's the cumulative effect of what a technology, there's sometimes there's things going on that literally you can't hear, transients and whatnot that are just giving you, there's an edge to it that after two or three days, you're just like bothered by something you don't know why, or you're edgy or you're stressed. And it's something that's working outside of the realm of that, that you can actually test in an A-B test over a couple of hours, just not possible. But all you do know is that after like, you know, the sixth or seventh day, the chipmunks movie, the squeakle, and I had those chipmunk <laughs> voices uh, in my ears for literally 12 hours a day, six days a week for a month. And, um, <laughs> and and it, it didn't take long, it did not it did not take long to realize that the extreme high end and the manipulation of the sound to get those voices that way were extremely irksome. Now there's a couple of things that that I want to get across here that's kind of important about this conversation. Um, digital now is getting to the point where these gentlemen are comfortable using it over analog. So when you so when people say so guess what digital you get really good good versus digital you don't have to stick to your records all the time you can get good high quality digital stuff the next thing too that that i want to point out is a lot of times uh, john was just talking about one um 96 24 192 24 all these different ways they can mix and we're going to talk later about atmos and dtsx and an imax enhanced before they would have all of this control all of this power all of this resolution and you couldn't have it at home. <laughs> now, a lot of times they would um, that stuff is available. They mix at these higher digital files, and then they would dumb it down for the home. You know, no longer you can a lot of times go out and get files at 192.24 or or double DSD or quadruple DSD. You can get 8K now. You'll I mean eventually you can get 4K HDR. You can get IMAX enhanced type content. So before these the the big vision that John and Gary had, they couldn't share that data with you. And that could have been because our internet speeds were dial up, but now that is that that whole thing is gone. So that quality is there. It just depends on how good of a system you have to extract that quality. Would you guys yeah, agree with that? Your content, you can get mm -hmm. super high res stuff and it'll sound easily as good in the home as it did in the studio, which is, which is exactly. Um, so, also, I noticed they're doing all digital now for when they're actually doing live performances, right? At, mm -hmm. at stages and, and stuff. Um, oh, you mean they're mixing all. consoles? Yeah, mixing consoles. They're all digital now, right? Console, but all the crossover, everything is all digital and it's all speaking to each other. Plus, the mere fact that, uh, you know, you've got um, uh, lighting sunk up to the click. Uh, you've got mix uh, automation on the consoles live that is sunk up to the click track. If people don't realize that there's so much complexity going on that without uh, the the sort of digital automation, you just couldn't do now what you mm -hmm. uh, what mm -hmm. sorry you couldn't do then what you can do now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. there, I I will tell you it does vary by. Sorry, I'm going to disagree slightly. It does bear, <laughs> vary by engineer. There are certain front of house oh. engineers that that only work in analog. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason that people have switched to digital is those boards weigh about 2000 pounds, mm -hmm. the analog ones. And they're just so much work to get mm -hmm. in and out of venues. But mm -hmm. it, it just depends on the mixer and the band. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the Motorhead guy dragged around an analog console. Uh, the Scorpions, it's an analog console. Mm -hmm. um, Let's see who else. Sammy Hagar. It's an analog console. Um, those are the ones I know about personally. 
the next thing we talking about consistency at the beginning about recording studios each recording studio is different and, and different and different things that you can do to get to come become familiar with that studio so if you start mixing something in paris and then they ask you to finish it in like alabama you know you um the record comes out the way you you had planned and sometimes you guys were talking about like i think gary said you actually carried your own monitors from place to place to place to kind of to kind of mix on just so that as a way of helping with consistency that was one thing that that you did right yeah uh john mentioned it also that that uh, top recording engineers just know their monitor really well and uh so quite often they uh install their own uh monitors uh rig uh within the studios because uh, they know them well for me i have a near field uh, pair that i love dearly and i will bring those with me and listen uh and also just also basically bringing material to different uh, theaters or st stages uh mm -hmm. that you already know and know well and so mm -hmm. you play something in Dolby atmos in a big room somewhere mm -hmm. and and you mix it and then you go somewhere else when you play at back you can sit there and assess the characteristic differences mm -hmm. between the rooms and sort of know where you're at and the reason why i brought this up is if you um we go into like we talk about these big massive recording studios or these big recording rooms right and they always have some really impressive sound system in it you know you know massive monitors but you always see <laughs> The speakers with something like those speakers with the white cones that every every recording artist every every uh every engineer kind of hates or not they just kind of cringes when they see them the little um and John was talking about playing it in different venues like I hear guys go out and play it in their car after they do that and can you talk about why you use these little these like these little play it back to a variety of different monitors again because i do want to stress that because people don't uh, about why you guys do that um in order to you know make sure it's a good it's a good track uh, we used to when when studios originally started um they had just one speaker in the middle and that was the reference for everything because when people were listening at home on their victrolas mm -hmm. um they were listening through some weird little system and mm -hmm. as hi-fi grew in the 70s, the need became really great to be able to listen to a really good set of, say, small or bookshelves or something. Um, but the driver in the 70s and even in the 80s were, were you know, radio mixes. You'd mix mm -hmm. almost differently for AM than you would for FM stereo. And so studios needed to offer more than one speaker. And most often, those big soffit speakers um, were either really good or terrible, but they were all loud. And so when the band came in after cutting tracks, you'd play it really loud. They go, ah, that's great. It feels great. Um, <laughs> the white cone technology that Yamaha invented, those are NS10s. NS10s, yes. NS10s are, are sort of a, I mean, I, I don't want to say that they're a go-to for everybody or nobody, mm -hmm. but there's a lot of guys that have mixed absolute huge selling albums on NS10s. Um, mm -hmm. Not me, I don't like them. They sound really edgy, but the old boogaboo about this thing was that if you can make it sound good on a pair oh, of NS10s, pair NS10s it's gonna sound, sound good, good on everything. Uh, you know, <laughs> but you've gotta listen to them all day long and there's your fatigue yeah. factor. So exactly. we use a lot of different types of monitors. Mm -hmm. Um, and often you'll have a three-way or a four-way switch on the console. This is big speakers, medium speakers, sort of midfield, and then your near fields. And the near fields over the years have gotten a lot better. Um, and so what most people these days, uh, a lot of folks don't even have consoles anymore. They just got a pair of monitors and a desktop and they're, they're mixing really with a control yeah. surface. Um, it, the speakers are sort of, um, part and parcel of the, some of the old rooms. They, as you said, they leave those speakers in, but most guys are using modern speakers. I think Gary was referring uh, the other day to a uh, monitor that he designed, which suits him well. So guys have all different approaches. Yeah, the reason why I brought this up is because um, you, the, they, they work hard to make sure it sounds good on, on as many different systems as possible. So yes, I got the tw I got the big system, or you may walk into a store and see the big system, but you may not have that opportunity in your home. 
to have the massive system. But these guys think about that. So whether you're playing it back on a pair of bookshelves or large set of floor standers, um, you're playing back a, um, a surround sound movie on a pair of sa a small satellites and subsystem or a big multi-channel system, they think about it. Believe me, they would prefer, Gary would prefer if you played it back on the big one, but he also they also take into account that you may not. So, so just know that the care that these guys take to make it sound good on a variety of things. If I may say that, that the real shocker, I remember the first time I was in a mall <laughs> And you know, there, there's the mall piped in music way like mm -hmm. 46 feet up in the air, you know, playing. And, uh, and all of a sudden you go, yep, that's my mix. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's, always, that's always a shocker, I must say. <laughs> yeah, so Jim, you had a question. I cut you I got off. A that can, you put that, can you put that last uh, picture back up, that last studio? Mm -hmm. um, so guys, why is there a single speaker way over on the left? Is that that car radio speaker, the mono mix <laughs> thing? Or? I don't think it is because it looks like a two way. So it's oh. either this, sometimes when you've got a loud band out in the studio, um, your mics are padded down and, and uh, your preamps are turned way down because the amps and the drums and everything else are so loud out in the studio. Uh, Hendrix was famous for four Marshall stacks in the room, and you couldn't go anywhere near the block he was playing on, much less in the in the room. And so you've got to set up a separate microphone to be able to hear them speak in between takes. And a lot of guys just put a, a mic and a and a speaker somewhere that that's the talk back between the artist. I, I'm not. I don't think that would be uh, considered a radio speaker. Usually, oratones, these little four inch speakers that are a cube were the de rigueur for years and years. Um, I'm not sure why that's there. It could be a, a really crappy busted cone speaker that is kind of essential for figuring out the old 57 Chevy mix, but. <laughs> yeah. Well, I have, a, I have another question too. I noticed, cause you guys were talking about the guys that have hard habits to break. Mm -hmm. I buy a lot of music uh, discs, concert discs. And for a while there, there was they were using no center channel. There was zero in the center channel. And eventually that transition was that the, you know, a zebra can't change his stripes. Yeah, it's a it's a learning process. And uh, yeah, I remember because I was one of the first guys that was working at 5.1, other formats followed. But uh, and, and that started many, many years ago. Uh, but uh teaching yourself what goes in the center i mean in the film industry we're used to the dialogue and a lot of the sound effects were not coming out of the center anyway but uh the, during the uh, 80s especially there were a lot of uh, musical uh groups that were having their songs put into films and they they literally uh used to send us the two track uh final print mix uh and i and i would say no you've got to send me the sessions I've got to make a clear, hard uh, center channel with the kick drum and the snare drum in the middle, the vocal in the middle, and spread it out, et cetera, et cetera. They, for the long, longest time, they couldn't understand this. And it was a growing uh, experience for a lot of engineers in the music business because they literally would say, what do I put in the center? Because they were so used to having a phantom center. It grew over the years, and now I think most people, you will not find that the center is empty. You will find that there is a, a good use of the center now. But it was just simply an education. I think there's a subject here that we haven't broached at all. And mm -hmm. that is that, uh, first of all, culturally, th the sensibilities of what people hear and how they hear them are completely mm -hmm. very different. But also mm -hmm. generationally, type mm -hmm. of not just the type of music that, that people are listening to. My generation listens to rock and roll or symphony, mm -hmm. whatever. Um, there's a much younger generations that are listening to all hip hop and this this sort of thing, but it's not just the the the, the uh, content. But in fact, my generation is used to listening to speakers. Mm -hmm. Let's face it, and Everybody else has I got literally sit on. down and focus on listening, mm -hmm. which people just uh, younger people don't do this, mm -hmm. and they listen completely on headphones. They listen on like earbuds, quite often beats or whatever it is, but they want to be doing something while they're listening. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> the, the idea that I have to sit there and just focus on listening to a, a you know, jazz fusion album or whatever, it's like, <laughs> you mean I can't get up and leave? No, focus. Focus on listening to the music, right? Well, it's a complete disconnect between my generation and the middle, uh, you know, a, a middle generation and a very young mm-hmm. generation. It's not just the, the material that they're listening to differently, but they listen to it, how they listen to it is different also. They, do, they listen to it in headphones, uh, Alexis uh, dome uh, things, you know, and they're, it's background. It's very much background. Yeah. And, yeah, we and talk it, about- drives me, it drives me crazy. But the bottom line is that's a subject in itself also. You're making me think of the image of that old Max L poster where the guy sitting in the chair. <laughs> The GBL, well, exactly. Yeah. If you Google it, it's called the Maxell yeah. Blown Away Speaker Ad. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's a great ad. Could we talk about passive and active listening a lot? You know, active listening, you sit down with your glass of um, wine, like Frederick, and sits and you play, and you play your re, your re, uh, your revoiced 80, uh, you know, BMWs, or the person that's out there barbecuing, you know, or, uh, or like playing a video game while they're listening to, you know, music through their headphones. Um, there's there's different there's there are different experiences and hopefully we can get more active listeners because there is um, there's a lot of information there. It, I think a good recording. Um, let's be let's be honest. Some of the most made the most amazing musical minds in the world no, are no longer here. They've all some of many of them are passed have passed away. And these recordings are the best way you're gonna you're gonna really experience. The, the soul of that person, the what that person's, you know, what that person brought to the world, whether it's a Bob Marley, you know, or Jimi Hendrix or whoever, you know, and, um, a Van Halen, you know. So just having that person, this, I mean, once you hear what it really, what uh, that, that person's real voice, you know, it really does change things. You're just trying to get the kids to sit down for a second and listen. You know, which is, and then, and, and hopefully we can get some new guys involved. Quite honestly, to defend some of the modern artists, you know, Billie Eilish may not be your, your cup of tea, but she and her brother spent a lot of time putting that album together, and they put a lot of thought and a lot of heart into mm-hmm. how they present their music. So, exactly. you know, pop music has always had these kind of throwaway ele- elements. Oh my gosh, you know, Frank Sinatra is just a pop star. He'll never, he'll never, <laughs> out the he'll never go anywhere. <laughs> He's not going anywhere, that guy, you know, and, and the Beatles, oh yeah, it's just a craze, you know, these four mop tops and whatever. And so music really gets defined by the generation. Um, and what is true, you know, 50 years ago, which is, you know, 16 year olds, when I was 16, yeah, I was listening to the Beatles, but it was on the crappiest possible system. It was a horrible little system, but I didn't care. I was just playing the records. It was great. I grew my hair out. It was wonderful. And so <laughs> the even the ear pods that people have now are almost better than the 45 RPM mono. You know, you, you put a <laughs> silver dollar on the tone arm so it doesn't jump the groove. Yep. And you're recarving yep. the grooves. You know, it's really... I just have to say, I think a lot of the presentations these days of stuff, if you watch a movie that Gary's mixed on your iPhone and, and cup your hand so the speaker actually now is bouncing towards you, it'll sound good. It'll look good. It's just a different experience. It could be a lot better if you've got an 80-inch screen and a, an 11.7 <laughs> version <laughs> system. But you know, the challenge has always been to mix this stuff or, or to record it in the first place and then mix it so that it sounds good on a wider and wider and wider range of playbacks. And that playback yeah. thing is always increasing on one end and getting worse on the other. So, you know, it kind of depends on your, your scope of it. But as people age, exactly. they usually request higher and higher fidelity. Exactly. And now what, that leads us to the, um, the multi-channel music thing, actually. Because uh, film mixers were uh more used to mixing uh 5.1 or multi-channel mixing early on uh <clears throat> when when musical artists started uh experimenting with the idea of 5.1 dvd music uh sometimes they were actually uh aware enough to use the music mixers from the film business that actually knew 
And mm-hmm. I remember once Jimmy Iveen came in to work with me on a Hall of Notes mm-hmm. thing for 5.1, and it was the song People Get Ready, mm-hmm. uh, which I, I oh, love yeah, that great, song. Great track, yeah. 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 But but there was a vocal chorus, and um, so I played it originally uh, in stereo up, up front, and it's like, okay, that's great. You know? And then I started playing it where the the vocal chorus, I, I, I played it, them in the more in the much more in the surrounds with the verb mm-hmm. leaking to the front and then mm-hmm. hollow notes were in the middle and then mm-hmm. verb leaking to the back so it became like a prelude and fugue you know mm-hmm. where they called they answered they called mm-hmm. they answered right but it, it didn't walk you back and forth because there was uh, a, a leak uh, a spread from mm-hmm. the front to the back and it just filled the room and it and it just gave it movement and it was beautiful. And Jimmy Iovine was freaked out. He, he just loved it. So there's there's very tasteful ways of going. And you, United Music Group, the UMG, United Music Group, are doing a lot of their catalog now in Dolby Atmos. Yes, yes. Music yes. Dolby Atmos mix. And they're yeah. converting a lot of music that way. And it's turning out quite well, actually. But John, is there a way sometimes people go off the rabbit hole, go down the rabbit hole and make a bad multi-channel? The quad, the quad experience back in the 70s, I think, is to blame for a lot of interest in surround or disinterest because they killed the format. But mixing right. the quad was the real experience because they'd usually get the, in the best case, they'd get the guys that mix the album. One of the things about multi-channel music um, that you have to kind of contend with is if it's been a, a hit album in stereo, you can't go too far away from that mix. If mm-hmm. you do, people get pissed off. They just mm-hmm. really start getting angry that you've made a different experience for them. Mm-hmm. And their experience is essentially listening to the stereo mix, or in some mm-hmm. cases, like the Beatles mono tracks. Um, the mono experience. I mean, the stereo tracks that on early Beatle albums were just afterthoughts, and the T Boy with <laughs> voice over things. here, band yeah, over, music, music over there. Or, or, <laughs> and so when you go to do, um, you know, a, a big pop album from whenever that was stereo, you have to pay attention. You have to always reference the stereo mix. When we're doing Neil Diamond and Quad, mm-hmm. we always had the two track available as a reference. Because, man, you could get so far afield of your, you know, you could have the band in the back and Neil in front, and that would be terrible. Um, so, you know, you really had to pay uh, a lot of attention. Just because the technology exists, you can abuse it quite easily. And there are plugins now that will spread it around. And you have control of that so that you can actually be respectful of the original. But a lot of guys go, oh, that's so cool. And they move it all around. And you're like, Wow, now the, every flaw of Cher singing is sticking out. Everywhere. If she was here, she would shoot the engineer. She would shoot the engineer. And, and it's like, no, could you be tasteful? Could you be respectful? That's yeah. that's the key. So Frederick, so I, you popped up. Yes. It's like you probably have yeah. a, something you want to add. You add. Exactly, because we were talking about multi-channel music. And in the 90s, uh, DTS came out with a lot of remasters, uh, CDs, basically. Mm-hmm. And then afterwards, mm-hmm. also D, uh, DVDs with DTS encoded 5.1. And mm-hmm. I think that's a good a good example of uh, multi-channel uh, music. And the artist intent is a album from Alan Parsons on air, which mm-hmm. was recorded in 5.1. It was DTS. It was a 20-bit recording. Mm-hmm. And it's themed uh, with, uh, with flights, everything related to flight. And at one point in one of the tracks, Alan is walking. Uh, uh, doing a 360 with his guitar, he's going 360 degree all the way around the, uh, basically around your living room. So it's very engaging. And I thought that was an interesting approach on on how to rediscover music in Surround. Unfortunately, a lot of these versions uh, of discs were completely odd where you have like drums in the back, percussion <laughs> in the front, and the thing, right? I agree with that. But I thought Alan Parsons on air was a good example of how you could make something uh, make use of technology to create something really with yeah. the artist intent to create yeah. some little magic in your living room, so to speak. So what were you going to say, Jeff? 
Oh, I was curious if we get some of the benefits of of, uh, of a reference because one of my one of my pet peeves about the audio or the music two channel side is that we don't get the benefit of those those references. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious if we get that with surround music. If mm -hmm. if surround music is mixed in in some of these stages, or is it more ad hoc? Mm -hmm. I, for my for my experience, it's mixed in recording studios where they either have um, the speakers in the rear already set up, uh, or they'll just bring in speakers on stands. You know, modern mm -hmm. studios are set up for surround mixing just because you'd be kind of an idiot to design a studio that only does two channel mixing. Mm -hmm. um, but one of the one of the issues that is really important, and I think. Um, you know, Jeff may have something else to say about this, but there's there's sort of a a, a, a fakeness to some of the surround things that are done. There there's a digital reverb put on a mono track to make it sound like it's in a hall. Um, but if you've ever heard something that was recorded with either four or five microphones in a in a surround array. Um, it's really amazing the sense of space that just that recording gives you from a, a phase coherent playback system where it's time aligned and, and the room isn't doing too much weirdness. Um, mm -hmm. Down in Elvis's former studio, I think it was in Memphis, and there's a guy that had set up four microphones in the live room and then played back with four speakers and he, he recorded himself throwing pencils. You know, just lead pencils into each of the four corners of the room. And the playback of these pencils being tossed and bounced around the room as you stood in the middle was astonishingly lifelike. You turned your head and looked for the pencil. Um, it, was com it was completely immersive with just the four channels of playback. And so I think we're moving into a really great space now where we can get height and an extra side and back. Mm -hmm. um, we can get low frequencies that are really truly accurate. I think we're going to see artists start to record music and mm -hmm. um, and and other um, things, theaters and things like that, so mm -hmm. that the audience can actually hear what they intend. They are mm -hmm. recording and writing and creating for an immersive environment, which is okay. I think going to be a, a renaissance for a lot of things. Universal music. Um, has a whole division now that is just uh, completely targeted to and designed for uh, Dolby Atmos mixing of uh, a lot. They're remastering a lot of the classics uh, in uh, in Dolby Atmos, and they are committed to it. They have a whole division for that. Yeah, because I've been the title. I've been the t like a uh, title has their whole uh, like um, now. If you have a, a higher end title in the United States, you can actually get tracks in in Dolby in Dolby Atmos. And Glenn, we want some DTSX stuff too, man. You know that would be actually kind of nice too. Um, yeah, are, we have all are you guys? For, our yeah. push lately has been in more into the theatrical stuff, and mm -hmm. you know this whole music thing. You know, from stereo to quadraphonic to immersive and then back again is a sine wave, right? It seems like it just keeps <laughs> over every 10 years. I want lots of channels. I don't need I don't need that many channels. Keep it simple. I want lots of channels. Keep Thank it simple. God we're kind of coming up the MP3 thing now. You know? yeah, yeah. Getting back up there a bit. <laughs> yeah. well, 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 John brought up a big point too about the fact that you have all these different, because we've done sessions on Adobe Atmos and DTSX and immersive stuff and how you have objects and stuff. And you can have hundreds of objects, but a lot of times it's like you, you can you can do too much with this and if oh, you try to use all these I, objects yeah so yeah. What, you want to talk about that gary about why you don't use all these things anytime there's a new technology uh, people have to experiment and find out what's tasteful and what's right and what's wrong and it's like uh, it's like having a two-year-old at home uh, they're going to run into the the coffee table every once in a while and uh <laughs> a lot of people overdo it uh, they misuse it and then it doesn't do the artist or the director or whomever any favors by deflecting the focus mm -hmm. uh, in other places in the room. And mm -hmm. to tell you the truth, even when I do big Dolby uh, Atmos feature films, uh, it's it takes a lot of uh, tasteful sitting on your hands to not uh, do stupid, wonderful things <laughs> and keep the focus keep the focus on making us all feel a certain way or, or feel 
something that is we're supposed to be feeling that the artist is telling us that he wants to come across to yeah. the audience. So save the 140 effects for the battle scene in a battle and like yeah. in like saving Private Ryan. Then you can have bullets and stuff whizzing all over the place, but you don't yeah. need that when you're on, on most things. Even even That's if you're doing a car chase, I don't think you need 9,000 things whizzing around the room either, right? Well, one of the worst things that we did in quad, Quadraphonic had had a lot of hardware made for it. And we used to have a quad panner. It was like a little joystick panner. Um, I remember distinctly that you could you could swirl the sound around the room and you could induce vomiting really pretty easily. <laughs> and, um, and it was, you know, you'd get some of these guys that would just go, hey, it's a swizzle stick. And they just go, stop. And so yeah. those things went away, fortunately, really quickly. Yeah, I have a question for you guys, um, for, the, for the audio. Then sort of moving forward from today with this whole COVID thing, now we can't go to concerts as much as stuff. So let's say we do have a home set up with lots of speakers, including heights. But, you know, what I'm missing is going to a live theater or, you know, to an outdoor amphitheater and stuff. So what would you do for us to replicate that in my home if I do have these speakers? Mm -hmm. The big venue. We'd spill beer on your shoes. <laughs> <laughs> That would do it. I can do that on my own. <laughs> I got that covered. I'm always amazed at how many people have uh, multi-channel systems at home. Uh, and uh, the setup is, is so bizarre. What they've done with choices and options, which they've had too many options or whatever, but, uh, and also acoustically, the setup is one speaker by a window, one speaker by the restroom, whatever. Um, that uh, you know, you go and you go. Wow, this doesn't sound anything like what I mixed. And I'm watching on their television uh, a, a film that I mixed, and I'm like, wow, this is a mess. What, what's going on? And a lot of people don't realize that when it works, and it works really well, you can listen to a concert from uh, Austin City Limits or something like that, and you can feel like you're really there. But if your system is not attuned correctly or uh, put together correctly it, it it's a joke mm -hmm. it's, it's oh, yeah. sad oh, yeah. it's a joke yeah you know and we were talking we were talking about that too like some of the things um that's why jeff is here to help with that and that's and that's that john's like main job is to help with that as well because if the the your room and your system has an effect you can take gary could spend the his entire life or or how long does it take them to, to mix a movie Norman, how many? How long are you normally on a project? Well, it, it on an average, I would say uh, on a big movie, if it's an action thing, mm -hmm. at least three months. Okay, so Gary spends uh, three months working on something, and he yeah. with all this care, <laughs> and then it gets to your house and wow, you know. So, so that's why you know, and that's why he gets so fired up sometimes. We had um so. But three months could be could be longer than that, right? If you have to go back and do uh, do additional oh, yeah. work, right? So oh, yeah, without a doubt, without yeah. Now, now, how long does it take to mix a? Now, does it take longer to mix a movie or a record? Movie definitely. Although the Neil Diamond album took three months of overdubs and mixing. It takes uh, <laughs> definitely a movie for for me, and I think a record is always a matter of the first the first tune or the first mm -hmm. two tunes. Mm -hmm. It's what when you're setting a style and you're setting your template up for how you're going to EQ or uh, assign things, etc. But once your sort of your template is down and you have a sense of style for what this album or the, what this project is going to sound like, then it then the process speeds up a little bit because you have a lot of basic stuff decided on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A lot of it's a budget. I mean, yeah. how, how big a budget have you got, and how much time can you nitpick? Yeah. Because because the question I have about it is um, normally I was thinking when they mix a movie the the director and everybody kind of knows where they're going they what they want to do they've already recorded the the uh, the actor's dialogue they already know what kind of scenes they're going to do and I always see those stories about the musicians going into a studio and not really knowing what they were going to make they just buy a bunch of studio time you know what I mean and then kind they kind of have an idea that's why i was wondering why it could it could it take longer because a lot of musicians may not have a hundred percent in their head what they want yet 
you know, so, music is a lamination project, um, mm -hmm. much like movies. Mm -hmm. Movie lamination is more vertical. You've mm -hmm. got film, you've got effects, you've got you've got all kinds of different silos. Mm -hmm. In music, it's right. basically a horizontal lamination. You're you're putting mm -hmm. together drums and bass and guitars and pianos and orchestras and whatever else you've got, um, and you're trying to make by laminating it all and deciding on this sound or that sound, you're trying to make mm -hmm. basically one thing. Um, mm -hmm. It's the same thing with a movie. You're trying to make one experience. If, mm -hmm. if somebody says, wow, that was a great sound effect, or wow, listen to that snare drum, you've failed kind of because it's, nobody yeah, wants it's, to. It's called the silent art. Yeah, yeah exactly. you know, it's called you're the silent really, art. You're yeah. really cooking something so that you you have one thing at the end. You have a song. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. every decision in a record needs to be made around the song. The song mm -hmm. is the is the driver, regardless of who the personality that's the the champion for the song. It can be the songwriter, it can be the producer, it can be the singer, mm -hmm. whoever. Mm -hmm. You're still trying to make the song as good as you can possibly make it. And those decisions are all lining up with the song. All right. So we are we are officially at the end. Um, so we have to for those two people who have to leave. We'd like to thank our guests, um, uh, John, Gary, Glenn, Jeff. Having you guys here is always a pleasure, as well as um, Frederick and Jen and Jim helping us um, th th do these particular sessions. So those who have to leave, we'd like to say take care, and we will talk to you soon. So so hopefully we can stay for a few more minutes and, and bring up Frederick and Jim to answer, um, to, to toss out a couple of questions for another 15 minutes, and then the rest of us also have to go to work. <laughs> except for except for Frederick, he's going to go have a cocktail and go to bed. All right. So so what what do we have some questions for these particular gentlemen? There's one question from Balaji, and I'm not sure how it's probably either Gary or John. So his question is, generally speaking, the original recording for music is in a two-way format, uh, which is highs and lows. But during the music stage, the mixing stage, you lay emphasis on the mids, thereby creating a three-way format. Is that correct? I'm not quite sure how to interpret this question. Yeah, it's a good question. So you start with two-way format, mids, highs and lows, and then you go with the mids. Boy, you Gary can answer that one, John. <laughs> Yeah. Thanks, Gary. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you. Um, music, you know, it, it, in terms of arranging the music and, and the original music itself, um, you are talking about a, a frequency set of ranges. A flute is very high frequency, a bass guitar is very low frequency, but we don't really record in terms of high, mid, and low per se. But what I will say is that often when we're doing a, a stereo mix um, of a band with a singer or singers, um, we will scoop out the mid-range on the instruments a little bit so that the mid-range of the voice can project a little bit more without turning it up. Equalization is basically just fancy tone controls. And we, we're to the point now where we can really zero in on, on what, we, what we call doinky frequencies. If your drum just has a weird doink to it, we can pretty much turn that down with real selectivity. Um, and, and, you know, if your voice is too spitty on the top, we've got de that work really well for that. But primarily, we're trying to get the mix sound as full range as possible. But yes, we will EQ hi-hats a little brighter and then roll off of the low end. We will make the bass guitar and the kick drum sound uh, a lot more authoritative at low frequencies. But you, you can't have a kick drum without 2,000 hertz. Kick drums that are only 500 hertz and down sound like cardboard box, which I've recorded. We, we have recorded cardboard <laughs> boxes, and they weren't too bad. Um, so really, the frequency range is more what are we scooping out or what are we adding to things so that their clarity in the mix is more evident. So yes, it's, it's a concern, but we don't tend to record or think primarily in two or three bands of frequencies. In, in, uh, in film or movie uh, sound, the, uh, the orchestra uh, is recorded you know, on a scoring stage and uh, it's a, a controlled environment. 
even if the even if uh, Tom Morello is playing guitar with the orchestra or whatever, it's all just a controlled environment. He's at least he's in a booth, right? But the rest of the uh, elements that go to make up the soundtrack are come from disparate and uncontrolled environments. For instance, the production sound, the dialogue that was recorded on the set or whatever, that guy's working his butt off to try and get decent recordings. The recordings of the car buys or the gunshots, they're all done by uh, effects editors that do great recordings in the field, et cetera, but they're not done at the, all at the same time. So in the mix, uh, I take the orchestra and whatnot, but and, and quite often, I don't have to change the EQ at all. It's beautifully recorded and it's really full and rich and it's all around me and all that sort of stuff. How nice, that's really great. But there's tons and tons of uh, EQ work and, uh, and, and noise reduction work, et cetera, that is done to all the other various elements that are, are produced. And as you say, John, with EQ, especially in production, uh, you know, I'm trying to get rid of not only the background noise and get the the the, the signal level up, of, uh, the presence of the dialogue, but I'm also trying to take the microphone away and be consistent with it because as direct, as actors move around, et cetera, et cetera, so does the the sound, the frequency response of the voice, and whatnot. And you're literally EQing as people are moving. You're changing. You're chasing the EQ. It's a massive job. That's why these things take months. But when you when you talk about uh, stuff that's recorded for a movie having being split into highs or lows or or stereo it's not that's not an issue that's not that the, there's way more issues than that there was one more question from Waldemar with regards to multi-channel music so he heard some great Dolby multi-channel music at the Hein show in Munich uh, and then of course this Glenn is not here so he can't answer but you Gary and John probably can What's the tendency right now for multi-channel music? Is there still demand? I mean, Atmos, Dolby Atmos is starting doing multi-channel music. What about the other formats? When you get UMG uh, pouring a whole a lot of money into a division that is just transferring all their masters to uh, Dolby Atmos, I think that the demand has to be there. I don't think that they're doing it uh, willy-nilly. That's a lot of money they're spending, a lot of studio time, a lot of engineering time, and, and even just putting the product out there. I think that their intent is to, uh, to have the market uh, to a certain degree follow, but at the same time, it, they wouldn't be doing it unless the market was driving it to a certain extent. Well, and that, that dictates a lot of immersive music or surround music content. Um, there, as I said the last time there, I was a, attended a webinar um, by George Massenberg, who's really uh, an amazing mixer, um, mix some of my favorite ac albums. And they were talking about experiments that they've done at McGill University about multi-channel height and, and lower uh, speakers in a 22 dot, <laughs> 5.18, you know, massive amounts of speakers in a big grid. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen at home, but what they're doing is they're experimenting with what's the minimum number of channels you need for full immersion, what's the best way to mix these things. A lot of music people are still mixing um, from mono channels. You know, you've got a mono channel on a vocal, you've got a, a mono mic on, on a guitar amp. These are not necessarily stereo or surround producing. Um, mm -hmm. events. So the experimentation is still going on. We're really not sure if, if you got a music mix, what are you going to put in the height speakers? The mm -hmm. hi-hats, the cymbals, the flute, <laughs> the soprano backup yeah. vocals? Hopefully just the ambience of the room. <laughs> yeah. So I think like I, I want said, the drum kit up there. <laughs> oh, <God. I'm> <laughs> um, so it's, you know, it's, are you sitting in the middle of the band? Is the band wrapped around you? Is the band far away? You know, those are all questions for the artists. How do they want their music to come out of the speakers? What, you got one more question, Jim. We have to, we oh, have. I just, we all have, I was just going to comment. Um, I found a guy in England mm -hmm. that actually um, not only mixes music in Atmos and it's mm -hmm. more, you know, uh, electronic, but he actually actually writes it in Atmos. So when he's creating his content, he's actually, you know, on Thinking the fly. About it from the beginning from the beginning. From the beginning and doing it that way. And it works uh quite good in mm -hmm. my my opinion. 
exactly. I guess if you plan from the beginning you know, to use it, it's going to work out. If I may, for what it's worth, scoring composers for film are starting to realize that uh, that they should make that a consideration because they don't want their music pulled down when the dialogue starts. They don't want it interfering. So they're starting to uh, figure out to give us elements and it translates really well. So that's that's a trend that's uh, that catch, catching on. Yeah. Okay. I do have so, a question though, Phil, if you if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, to John and Gary, uh, is there a movie or a record that you wished you had uh, mixed or worked on? Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> All of them. <laughs> any, any movie, any movie that I, I sit and I'm, I'm like, I'm crying and I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. I'm like, Jesus, I wish I had mixed that. <laughs> On the other hand, you know, there's 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 this tendency when you're actually working on an album, um, it, it may not be your favorite artist, or it may not be, you know, your childhood idol or whatever. And so you're 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 a professional. You're doing your best job on something that isn't. I mean, I only own Neil one Neil Diamond album. It's the one I worked on. So um, on the other hand, I own every band album that the band ever put out. And so uh, sometimes you have to be a little careful, especially in music. If you're going to work with people that you really have thought the highest of, and then you find out they're possibly not the best humans in the world, it can <laughs> sometimes uh, wreck your appreciation of that artist. But generally, when you hear things that are really the well opposite, done, the is man, I wish I'd done that. Yeah, the opposite is true. Also, where I, I not, I wasn't necessarily a huge Beatles fan. I was like, you know, it's like Rolling Stones or Beatles, you know. Right? But then I worked with Paul McCartney and I worked with uh, 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 George Harrison really closely, and I just loved George Harrison. And it ch changed my mind about what I was listening to, you know. We are going to have you guys come back because we're going to have to do a round two because all of this information of these last two days has been outstanding so so guys i'd like to thank you guys for coming hopefully um hopefully gary you'll want to come back john's a regular jeff's a regular glenn's a regular so hopefully i think you enjoyed this and you'd want to come back and hang out with with our with our group again and Great we'd time. like to thank the we'd like to thank the I, I sound thank united you, training I team thank you for the opportunity yes Oh, it was it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure. You guys are fascinating. And I'd like to thank the Sion United training team for for putting for pulling this off. Um, and of course, all of our partners. So thank you guys again for coming. And you hopefully you got something um, from this session, everybody out there in the audience and take care and we will talk to you soon.